if you want. And uh, sure enough, uh, you know, I, I got breakout running at home, and uh, it did just that. You know, it's very stable. Is it TensorFlow? Uh, I think, no, this is Torch. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll get into that in a sec um, if you're interested. But the, uh, the Google Atari project was built on top of Torch. Uh, most, uh, most of what Google does, obviously, is now, is now built on TensorFlow. Um, but uh, so when you get into re reinforcement learning, the, the actual guts of it, um, it's, uh, you know, there are a couple different flavors of it, but this is basically how it works. Um, a neural network's at the heart of it, and the thing that you're actually training that's actually learning is the neural network. And the input uh, is just the screen. It's all the pixels of the screen, and the output is all your possible moves. So in Super Mario Brothers, you have 15 possible moves. That's up, down, left, right, A and B, and then combinations of those. Um, I don't think there's a move that's A and B. Somebody knows A and B at the same time. Does anyone know Super Mario Brothers better than I do? Because um, I think that, I, I don't think I, I modeled that, but I don't think it's actually used in the game. Um, and so that's the output. So you've got 15 um, outputs, including do nothing, uh, which is a valid action as well. And so the output of your neural network at each step is its estimate of the best move. Um, that's what you want to try and train. And then every time it makes a move, it records the experience. So it records the screen uh, when it, before it made the move, the move that it made, the reward, in other words, a change in score, or if it got killed, and then the screen that results, resulted from that move. And what you're trying to um, optimize then is, you know, you're trying to make its prediction of what the best move is, or, you know, and what reward it will get actually match what happened in reality. And so that's the cycle that it goes through in order to uh, learn. Um, and this is done then, you know, many thousands, if not millions of, of times uh, in the course of uh, training. Um, and the other thing that's interesting and, and also kind of infuriating about um, uh, machine learning is there are a lot of levers you can play with. There are a lot of parameters that you can adjust to change the way that the machine learns. Uh, one of the most important is the learning rate. So this is how fast you know, um, the machine should um, you know, adapt to new information. And you'd think it, at first naively, oh, I want it to be as fast as possible. But what happens is it ends up, um, if you set it too high, it ends up ba banging around without actually converging on anything. It's a, an analogy would be like you know, you're following the latest um, uh, you know, dieting fad without actually spending enough time on any given um, program to see results. And so you keep bouncing around um, you know, in different uh, approaches without actually ever settling on something that works. And so learning rate is, is critical. Um, the next one is called explore versus exploit. And this is the amount that you want to go and try new moves that aren't necessarily currently the ones that your model predicts are the best um, because you might learn something uh, versus, um, look, I just want to max out my score. Um, I want to you know, uh, uh, just play every time what the model predicts. And the risk is if you don't have enough exploration, you get caught in what's called a, a you know a local local minimum, uh, which means that you know it's like, yeah, you're a pretty good player, but you're never actually going to get better because you're not willing to. And I don't mean to anthropomorphize this too much, but you and the machine are not willing to experiment enough. And so typically, what you would do over time is you crank down the ratio of, of explore exploit. And so at first, it explores a lot, and then as time goes on, you expect it's learning stuff. Okay, we're going to decrease the amount that it actually is exploring. We want it just to play the best strategy we think it can. Um, memory size. So, you know, uh, how far back should you maintain experiences? Because as the machine learns and gets better, hopefully, um, it's not necessarily you know, those early experiences aren't necessarily going to be that useful. Um, that's another parameter that you can play with. And then discount rate. Um, how much do we prioritize immediate rewards over rewards that happen multiple time steps into the future? And so if you, set that, um, if you set the discount rate very aggressively, that means that your computer is basically a pleasure-seeking hedonist um, that, will only, that will try and max out current rewards at the expense of anything that happens in the future. And on the other you know, extreme, um, you know, your computer might treat uh, something that happens you know, way down the road equally with what happens right now. 
And so that's another key parameter that uh, you have to uh, fiddle with. So um, this finally kind of brings us to, uh, to my own project, which was to take Google's uh, uh, code that we just saw and uh, apply it to Super Mario Brothers. And uh, the reason I wanted to use Super Mario Brothers is it's a more complex game than the Atari games. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, it involves, it, it's, it's a little bit less kind of arcade style, you know, games last longer, and there are a lot of different things going on uh, beyond Atari. Uh, but not so far beyond Atari that it would be kind of, you know, uh, too, too difficult. And so, um, this is a video I took of uh, when, it very, when it first started uh, learning. And so here, I, I, just, I just turned it on, and all the actions that Mario's taking right now are random. So even if it seems like he's you know, doing things in the right way, he's actually not. He's just experimenting. And so right now, his explorer is set at you know, 100%. And he's just exploring his space and trying to figure out, oh, there, OK, he got 200 points. OK, maybe that you know, question mark thing he actually you know, means something. And um, this is how um, learning kind of always starts. It, it, you know, the, uh, the machine just tries out different things. It doesn't look like it's doing any, you know, it has any strategy whatsoever. Um, and yeah, it does actually, you know, just by random luck, get some, uh, you know, get some rewards. But um, this all comes together then after 72 hours of training. Um, it's figured out the first level, it's got it dialed. So here it goes. And it's, it's pausing because this was really taxing my computer to both play it and record this video. So unfortunately, there's some pauses in it. Um, but this took, a, this took a lot of effort to get to this, this stage. Um, it took a lot of experimenting with different uh, uh, parameters and a lot of patience. Um, because, uh, you know, you, you have, I basically had my computer probably running for a all, all in a, a couple of weeks at a time, um, you know, training, um, trying to figure out how to play this game. And uh, this was the, the best that it did. And I figured, you know, finally when I hit this, I was uh, ready to, uh, to call it a day and <laughs> let my computer have some rest. Um, was it basing it simply on score? Yeah, so initially, yes. Um, and uh, the problem was I wasn't seeing, see here, it, it gets killed there. Um, it wasn't progressing very fast. And I ended up, I really resisted this idea, but I ended up adding a reward for moving to the right. And then there's, watch this move. This is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, he figured that one out, which I thought was really cool. But, uh, and then he gets penal penalized for dying because it also seems like um, you know, he was not sufficiently uh, uh, concerned with, about his own safety. Um, and uh, so I did actually add a, I added a penalty, and you can definitely quibble with that because it detracts from kind of the purity of the experiment. Um, and uh, the way I justified it is, you know, people kept, who are much better Super Mario Brothers players than I am, uh, kept saying, oh no, you know, forget the score. Like, you know, Super Mario, it's, it's about like finishing the level. Like, that's what you want to do. You know, you want to move to the right, you know, and finish the game. Like, the score is just kind of an afterthought. And so I said, okay, fine. So I'll add a reward for moving to the right because that's how a human would view the game. Um, but you can, you know, you, you can definitely quibble with that. Um, and so this is the project I'm working on right now, uh, which is, uh, you know, I mean, it's like every couple months a new paper comes out, um, you know, often by Google, uh, pushing the state of the art uh, further. And um, their most recent paper... Uh, was about um, I'm gonna turn this on. parallelizing the learning. And so um, what this is is eight different Super Mario games going at once. And each of these games is learning on its own. So it has its own model of the game, its own strategy. And then periodically, they all update um, and sync with a shared model. And so um, that is kind of it was based on uh, on this paper here, um, and it just th this just came out you know very recently, uh, and um, 
uh, what really caught my eye because it took so long to train, you know, what, what I just showed you is, uh, you know, they, you know, after four days, you know, they got better results than after eight days with the uh, algorithm that I just uh, demonstrated. And so, I, you know, I said, wow, that's a major improvement. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is what I'm experimenting with right now. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so why is this such an exciting area? It's, well, because of all the things you can do with it. Um, you know, machine learning has application just in countless different areas. Um, it's advancing so fast, probably mostly now because um, we have very powerful machines. Uh, the algorithms that, um, every algorithm that I showed you more or less is probably at least, you know, 10 years old. You know, people thought of these things way back, uh, way back when, but because computing power is so cheap now and readily available, um, you know, it's feasible to actually train, um, you know, complex models uh, using these algorithms where it would not have been feasible before. Um, this is a huge one, the proliferation of open source tools uh, for building your own neural networks. Uh, this is absolutely critical. Um, without these, it would be really hard to make any progress. Uh, but, you know, thank goodness there are a number of tools available now that are very widely used and are really good, and um, they're being improved all the time. And, uh, you know, then the other is, is the availability of, uh, um, um, you know, games, competitions like ImageNet, um, you know, Mario, Atari, that you can use to compare different approaches and see what works the best. Uh, so that's the other, the other reason that the uh, field is advancing so quickly now. Um, and I'm gonna po I'll post these slides if anyone wants uh, you know, to take a look at any of this stuff in a little bit more detail. But you can get you know, uh, all of the code for the Google Atari project. Uh, you can run it at home. Uh, this is the paper they published about it. Uh, this is my own code if you're interested in getting Super Mario Brothers working. This is the text generator I used. Uh, this is the uh, um, project I'm working on right now. And then you asked about TensorFlow. These are the different tools that are uh, probably most commonly used in machine learning. Uh, Theano, I've used all of these. Yeah, I've used all these. I've never used TensorFlow, but I've used all the others by now. Um, uh, Torch is what Google used for the Atari project. Um, Chainer is what I'm using for uh, uh, this project and so on. And so you can get uh, the code to all these. And if you want to um, try this at home, if you have a, enough of a tech background um, and sufficient motivation, um, each of these uh, has a lot of tutorials that you can work through and uh, learn for yourself. Um, I think all of these except for Torch are in Python. Torch is in Lua, which is kind of a pain to work in. Um, so if you know Python, you can jump right into uh, um, to any of these and get started. Uh, so that's it. So, uh, you know, we can answer, answer questions, do discussion, anything you guys are curious about now. Could I try to tell you what I think I've learned and you tell me how I messed up? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so it seems to me that um, machine learning is uh, computer programming where, you know, a bunch of if-then statements. You start off with some assumptions which may be delivered by pictures or whatever, whether you, those assumptions are you can stand on this or you can jump on this or this will kill you or not. Like, I guess there's two different ways. But you have those assumptions and you have if-then statements and it has options, buttons, whatever that it can do. And there's some sort of a random function when it starts off. And so it does, randomly it does something and then records what happened. And then in taking that trial and error, registering what happened and pushing it in the future, it builds something together um, where it starts to look less like random and more like learning. Um, and I'm guessing on iteration 100, it would look a lot like iteration 99 with very minor changes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that's, that's, right? that's yeah, that's, that's, that's generally, uh, you know, correct. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of detail. Um, you know that that goes into it, and there are a lot of di there are many different ways of um, uh, approaching machine learning. Uh, there's a great book uh, we were talking about it right before we started. Um, let me get to my um, called uh, the Master Algorithm, and this is uh, I just read this quite recently. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's about um, 
Oh, you know what? Sorry, that wasn't the one I was thinking of. This, this is also a good book, uh, but the, actually the one I was thinking about was the, um, I just also read this one recently. It's uh, called The uh, Universal Algorithm. And uh, I think that's what it's called. Oh, maybe it's not. Shoot. Um, hmm. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, one, can't you take Super Mario Brothers, which is itself a series of if-then statements, I would assume, and make it go super fast, and so instead of your computer being hacked for 72 hours, yeah. two weeks, couldn't you do it in, a, in an hour? Oh, man, I wish. Super Mario Brothers? Why, why can't you do that? <laughs> I, I, I actually, what I showed you was slow down. Like, I cranked it up as, as fast as it would go. Um, but uh, even as fast as my machine would run, it still took uh, at least a good 72 hours to get those kind of results. Yeah. When it's doing that, is it flying super, playing super yeah. fast? So much so fast that there's no way you can actually see what's happening? Uh, you can see what's happening, but it's, it's obviously sped up. Okay. You know, I, I, I mean, I didn't, I, the less I have to wait for it to do its thing, the better. So I actually I cranked it up as far as I could, but, you know, there's a limit to, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if you're Google, you can, you know, you can string together as many computers as you want and operate them in parallel, and they have essentially unlimited resources. But, um, you know, but even so, uh, the computers we can get now are sufficiently powerful that, you know, at home you can, you can do this stuff. It really helps to have a nice big, uh, you know, powerful GPU um, that also happens to make your video games run extremely well. <laughs> and so, see, I, I said before, there's a big overlap between uh, gamers and uh, people who are into machine learning. And one of those areas is uh, because they have very uh, high-performance uh, uh, GPUs. And GPUs, just, just so you guys know, in, in case you don't, are, called, are graphical processing units. And um, they are optimized for doing lots and lots and lots and lots of um, essentially matrix multiplication and addition. And uh, um, that's what computer graphics is all about. And so your CPU, the thing that mainly makes you know, the, your computer run, is optimized for handling lots of different processes at once. So that's why I have, you know, here I'm running um, you know, all these different tabs on my browser. I'm running my um, screencast uh, software and everything. And it all seems to be running simultaneously. It's actually not. But they're just being switched so quickly, it appears to us to be simultaneous. That's your CPU. Um, and so you want a good balance of the two if you want to, you know, have a computer that can um, learn as, as fast as possible. I'm, I'm trying to find the, um, gosh, what's it called? That book that I, uh, <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to look it up uh, offline, but um, the, uh, the author um, talks about kind of the, the different schools of machine learning um, and the quest for the universal algorithm. And the universal algorithm is this notion that there is one single uh, formula that can be used to learn anything. And maybe it's not the fastest for you know, task A or task B, but it will work. And that's kind of the holy grail of artificial intelligence. Um, because then it, as soon as I know that, um, I can throw any problem at it and given enough time, it'll be able to learn how to, it'll be able to figure out that problem. And so, you know, a lot of the quest of artificial intelligence is for, is for you know, trying to figure out what that universal learning um, machine looks like. What, who, yeah, that was it, wasn't it? I think that was, yeah. Oh, maybe that was the one I was, yeah, that was the one. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> no, I was, there's another one that's called Algorithms to Live By. Um, yeah, no, th th this is it. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, this, this is... Uh, um, you know, a really good introduction to machine learning if you're interested in the subject. Um, it's written at a very, for a very, at a very accessible level, and uh, he explains everything really well. Um, and uh, um, I mean, if you're interested in the subject, I would, you know, start here. I would, I would get Kurzweil's book because it's a lot of fun too. Um, and uh, but this, this will give you a great introduction to it. Yeah. I'd say very little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish I knew more about it. Yeah. I don't I don't I don't know how our, I, I mean I I'm pretty clueless about, you know, the, the latest cognitive science research and everything. 
Um, it's, it's just, there's another uh, book that does, t it's a little bit old by now, but it talks about that subject, which is, uh, it's called On Intelligence. And um, I haven't read this one yet. I think it came out in like uh, 2005, but it's for the, the, <laughs> the inventor of the Palm Pilot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> shows you kind of how, how dated it is, but uh, um, he talks about that. Kurzweil in his book talks about it. But these guys are essentially, you know, they're computer scientists. They're not cognitive scientists. They're not psychologists. They're not, um, you know, um, you know, they, they they don't really know. I don't think that much about the uh, the biological side of things. Um, and so it, I I wish I knew more about that subject. I think it'd be a fascinating thing to. Uh, um, to, to learn. Um, and one of the reasons that makes the subject in computer science so interesting is because it kind of mimics in a lot of ways how our own minds work. Um, maybe in some ways it does, maybe in some ways it doesn't. Maybe a computer learns things that it, in a way different than a human would learn. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of the, the similarities are just fascinating. Yeah? So the asynchronous stuff that they're doing now, yeah. is that a way to overcome slowness of the simulations? Yeah, it is actually. Um, and uh, because uh, uh, you're able to you know, explore the environment much more quickly that way, you know, because you've got all these different uh, uh, games going at once. Um, I mean, that's the way that our minds definitely do not work. I can't, you know, simultaneously, you know, be reading five books. You know, I wish I could, but um, computers can do that and then they can all um, cooperate and you know basically teach each teach each other what they learned is and cooperation genetic or is it no it's not like it's super species or something. no that would be really interesting yeah there are people who have done that work um it's called i want to call it cooperative um if you google like cooperative uh, machine learning you'll find that uh, but th this is actually let me um i just had it up a second ago uh here it is um, this is actually kind of uh, simpler um, because, uh, you know, it's just, all, you know, all, all, each of the uh, individual threads or processes, uh, you know, after a certain period of time just simply updates the, uh, the shared model. And so there's no kind of, you know, saying, hey, did this model work better? Did that work model work better? There's none of that. It just simply updates the shared model and then, it, and then they sync with it. Um, so that would be a level of uh, sophistication kind of beyond this. Um, but the, the nice thing about it is, I mean, you can, you know, you can read the paper if you're interested, but they, uh, you know, they got really nice results. Um, they were very stable, you know, so you could, you could tweak, you know, I was, I was saying like, here's a learning rate. You know, you can kind of be off with how you tweak some of these parameters and it can still learn, you know, it can still do okay. And that was one of the nice things about this, this approach. Questions? Yeah, questions. Since you're a computer science guy, yeah. maybe you can. This, this is a general thing. I'm, my thesis here is that, uh, that I'm thinking about in my mind is that um, human learning and machine learning are similar in that everything we do is if then statement is a cause and effect. And then there is no free will. I know that's a whole different can of worms beyond computer science. But the random function of a computer, right? That would be the one thing that's different potentially from cause and effect in this model. Is it true that a random function is actually not random based on the computer's clock or something? Yeah, like that? yeah, that's a yeah, that's a different subject. That's that's called uh, pseudo random. Okay. And so, yeah, pseudo random numbers are, um, I mean, there are any any different number of different ways to generate them. Like, let's say you take a. Uh, um, you know, see, let's see if we can find an old-fashioned old uh, cosine table. Um, remember these? So these are, these are tables of, uh, there it is. Let's see if we can blow this up a bit. Um, <laughs> nobody uses these anymore because we have calculators. But, so what this is, is pretty simple. It's just a table of uh, the cosine for different angles. Simple as that. So imagine now you took the fourth digit in each of these, eight, four, six, six, two, five, and so on. That, if, you did, if I didn't tell you where it came from, would really look pretty random. But it's actually pseudo-random, because what that means is if I know how I generated them, I can recreate it. And uh, 
it's, it's actually an interesting point because uh, with these, uh, the machine learning um, projects that, that I showed, I think all of them use um, pseudorandom numbers so that you can reproduce their results. And they start, you know, so, um, um, you know, even though, you know, you, you have randomness thrown into it, it's predictably random. And, uh, you yeah, you have a seed. So if I, so, yeah, so I tell you what my seed is, and then, um, you know, if you put in the same seed that I'm working with, your random numbers will be the same as my random numbers. Yeah. So you're then suggesting that there is a way to do an actual random thing in a computer program? Is that true? Ah, oh, boy. I don't, I don't know. What's the most random? Like radioactive decay? Radioactive decay is... That's pretty random. Like entropy? Yeah. You don't, yeah, you don't need, right, right. yeah, you, you don't need that level of, right. of purity. You don't know what it's going to be, so it's random to you, right? Well, yeah, it's, like you said, it's reasonably random. You can choose your random function. I would also, variety of things, and, but yeah. For research purposes, being able to reproduce that. Is, I, I should also yeah. kind of, um, uh, you know, you, you said it's a series of if-then statements. I, w I would actually say it's a little bit more subtle than that, because um, if-then is binary. It's either one or zero, on or off. But um, you know the, the neural networks will work in any number of shades of gray, and uh, so you know it can be you know a number between zero and two hundred and fifty-five. So it doesn't have to be you know if then you know it can be anywhere in between there. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty it's just it's really just multiplication. I mean it's well, it done on a very large scale. <laughs> it's a lot of multiplication. That's why GPUs are good at it. So the neurons are weighted, and that's that's what uh, yeah determines the likelihood of the pathways. That's everything. Yeah, everything is in the weights. Let me uh, go back up to these slides just to. Um, yeah, and so every one of these connections has a weight. Okay, and it's just a number. And so um, if, you know, the number 100 gets fed into each of these neurons here, that translates into 100 multiplied by 0.3, by 0.5, and by 0.8. And then those in turn get passed on to the next layer. And uh, so that's why at their heart, a neural network is pretty simple, you know. Um, all the action is how you, is in how you kind of, how you train it, how you optimize it, you know, how you set it up. Um, but uh, you know, each neuron can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, and uh, but each of those inputs has um, has this weight, and so the you know the step that you take as you actually learn is you go back and you adjust all of the weights in your neural network such that the output becomes closer to what you want it to be. Um, that's really all it is. Exactly. So, so there's some more yeah. input from the user in the program? Uh, it's automatic. Like, uh, you know, if like, you, take, uh, you take examples, like in supervised, you provide the examples, and unsupervised, it uses its own experience as the examples. So it said, like, you know, I hit this red button and I got shocked. Hmm. So therefore, hit the red button equals shock. And then maybe one time you do it and it doesn't shock you, then you're like, oh, well, okay, maybe not. And so, but you're, you're, you're learning, you're adjusting your, your predictions of what will happen given a certain outcome. And that's, um, you know, that's essentially what this is doing just on a very large scale. So, any idea what the parameters of this network are going to be? Like, what is width is and what is depth? Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Yeah. So, the, uh, the input for, the, uh, for uh, both the Atari games and the Mario games is uh, 84 by 84 grayscale. So, 84 pixels by 84 pixels. Um, and each pixel has a value of between 0 and 255. Then, um, let's see if I get... So yeah, to the grayscale, yeah. Okay. And then, um, um, let me find you the... I mean, we could really get into the, the gory details of it, but uh, um, where is this? Uh, here. I think they talk about it in this, in their paper. Uh, I think I just saw it. 
Oh, did you see it? Down, it was like 84 by 84. Here it is, yeah. 84 by 84, red, green, blue. Uh, and then they converted it to grayscale, I think. Um, oh, the other thing I didn't, I didn't show, which is actually really fun. Um, no, they, they, they t talk about that in, uh, is uh, they also use this algorithm to uh, play a uh, race car game. And so this is the computer actually uh, controlling the uh, race car. Um, and so the applications of this are rather obvious for Tesla and uh, other autonomous vehicles. So no human intervention, right? This is, you, you set up the, you, s you set the machine up, you said, go around the track as fast as you can, don't crash and then let it figure it out. And this is what it came up with. And it actually is quite good. <laughs> this would be a fun one to do also at some point in the future. Um, but uh, let's see. Well, with this particular algorithm that it uses, it, it optimizes more for CPUs. But um, it always helps to have a powerful GPU. Um, because it's basically running multiple processes or threads at once, and so each of those threads runs on a different core of your CPU. Um, yeah. Yeah. Increasingly, yeah. So people are starting to figure. Um, uh, people are starting to figure out. Hey, there's a market for GPUs outside of of gaming. So NVIDIA, which is probably the, the biggest maker of GPUs out there, is coming out with a line of GPUs specifically um, aimed at machine learning. And this is very new. This is coming out within like, here they mentioned deep learning. This is coming out, this is, uh, uh, these are just coming out in the very recent uh, past. Um, because that's a, increasingly a big market for them. It's uh, in, in Bitcoin mining too. That's, yeah. People don't do that so much anymore, but that's the other, that was the other thing that really caused GPUs to take off outside of gaming. Um, Have you priced them on either of the Yeah, so uh, like, you know, I, I wanted to try and run, um, well, okay, I mean, this is 2016. We don't have to have a physical computer. We can run our stuff in the cloud, right? Um, and so I actually, I tried running, uh, I got the Mario thing working in the cloud. Uh, but the problem is, it was, it was too expensive. You know, I might as well have, I might as well have bought another computer. <laughs> really? Yeah, after you get it, yeah, because uh, I got, uh, um, I used AWS, Amazon Web Services, so you can actually use um, something called a, a GPU instance. This is what I used, and uh, so this is in the cloud, right? Um, and uh, I think I used their second largest one, but they were just too expensive. And the other problem is a lot of times the actual hardware is a little bit outdated. Um, and so I can actually at home get a, a nicer GPU like the one I have. And uh, it has the, the side benefit of making my games run better. So it's kind of a win-win, you know? 100 of them would be really expensive.